Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You won't ever learn about your burdens until you take Christ's yoke and find out what God intends by them. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's the only yoke that is easy. It's the only burden that is light. You can try it the world's way, but it will drive you bananas, and it will ruin you. You try it Christ's way, and I've never had one testimony I ever, ever found of anybody for 6,000 years <clears throat> that said, I tried God, and he didn't do what he said he'd do. You say, well, that's pretty good. No, that ain't pretty good. That's perfect. Amen. Amen. Matthew 24. <clears throat> the sign of thy coming. <clears throat> Matthew 24. In Mark chapter 13, you'll find the audience that Jesus spoke to. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. That's what Mark says in Mark 13 and verse 3. It's the same passage as here. So he had four people he was talking to. <clears throat> we got a lot more than that right here today. Let's trust God to prosper his word as he did then. Matthew 24 and verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, poor, poor, deluded millennialists think that that's going to be a period after the church is, quote, raptured out. They don't realize the Bible said we must, through much tribulation, not exit, but enter into the kingdom of God. Dear soul, this, this church, the church has been in tribulation ever since Cain killed Abel. Why does Peter say, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that shall try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you? So what you understand here is after the church age, immediately after the tribulation of those days, when the church age is over, you're going to see these things. Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Now, the answer to the question in verse 3 is found here in verse number 30. The, what was the question? What is the sign of thy coming? Verse 30, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What is it? And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall, one word, see, see the Son of Man, one word, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man is the Son of Man coming. You say, well, what's going to get us ready? Verse 14, I've told you 1,152,000 million G in times. The, the, the timepiece with God is not national Israel, it's the gospel. And listen at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And you finish it out. You going to settle it in your mind or you going to still be troubled by all these fellers? They got so many loads, I don't know, I didn't know which one I was on. <laughs> Some of them going three and a half years. Some of them going seven years. Some of them coming back. Some, of them, I just, you know what? Some people rather climb a tree and believe a lie than just stand on the ground and believe the truth. It's just that simple. The gospel is. So what is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? Is everybody seeing the Son of Man coming? 
Does that begin to marinate? Does that begin to, you know, ruminate? Are you beginning to understand that? So what's the next thing on the agenda? Well, we've got to have some signs. Israel's got to go build a temple. Who told you that? That ain't what the Bible said. Well, Schofield said it. Well, he may be in hell right now. You don't know. You're going to follow Schofield or you're going to follow the Lord. The next thing on the agenda is the coming of the Son of Man. That's the sign. Here it is. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. This is going to be the sign of the Son of Man. It's going to appear in heaven. Who's going to see it? All the tribes of the earth uh, and, and, uh, shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What shall they see for the sign? There's three important words in verse 30. Sign, see, and coming. The sign is seeing him come. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled." He's telling them all about the things that's going to happen to him. Brother's going to turn against uh, brother, child against the father, and so forth, and all the things that they're going to go through. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, that's what you can know. <clears throat> Our lesson today really uh, is about what you cannot know. What we cannot know but of that day and hour knoweth no man know not the angels of heaven but my father only in another passage another gospel he said not the son of man either it doesn't mean that jesus as god didn't know all things it meant that he was not prepared to teach that because that was not something that was teachable it was not known to him in order to give to you he said i what i receive of my father i give it to you so I'm hiding that from myself, as it were. Not that he as God didn't know it, but he as the Son of Man uh, was not concerned with it because it was not teachable. Why? Because God wants us to have a watchfulness. But, no, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What does that mean? <clears throat> For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. What did we hear? Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for what? Glory God. What's missing in verse 38? You just said it. Say it again. Glory. The glory of God. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Listen. And knew not new not goes back up to verse 36 but of that day and hour knoweth no man and knew not until the flood came then the new right but it's too late the door shut the fountains of the great deep are broken up and the windows of heaven are open and took them all away listen so shall also the coming of the son of man be the majority of the human beings on the face of this earth are not going to know till it's too late. Right. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Be that close. One taken in, uh, in judgment, the other one left uh, for the angels to, uh, to gather, or vice versa, whichever way you want to take it. Two women shall be grinding in the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Now, verse 42. Watch, therefore. Why? For ye know what? Not. Not. What if you did know? Let me give you a, a date, and I know it's going to make your stomach turn sour, but April the 15th. What does that do to you? IRS. Income tax. Now, they probably one or two of you hot shots that get it done on January the 2nd. 
You know, but most of us, you know when we file? April the 14th. You know why? Because we know the day ain't here yet. December the 25th. I know some of you ladies, you start shopping on the 4th of July. But some of us run out on December the 24th and try to get something for somebody. <clears throat> you know why? Because it ain't here yet. We know it's the 25th. We are prone to procrastinate. Never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. Right? So, although the Lord knows, <clears throat> He is not going to let anybody else know. Why? Because God's people are supposed to be living holy and justly and honestly in this present generation. Looking for the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just the way it's supposed to be. So if you give everybody a date, they say, well, he ain't come for another thousand years. What did the servant do when he said, my Lord delayeth, he's coming? He began to be cruel and unkind to all. Watch therefore, connected to what? For you know not. You know not, therefore you have to watch. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known, in what, in what watch, and watch it now, the thief would come. The Lord amazes me. He says he's going to come as a thief in the night. I'm amazed at what all, of all the things that God compares himself unto. Like a hen, he says, he gathered her brood. He compares himself to a chicken. Uh, like a lamb, and here he is like a thief. And uh, their soul, God's not going to be a thief to those who don't have anything <clears throat> in the world worth stealing. Their treasure's laid up in the glory of God. But to the world, he's going to come like a thief. For had he known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour <clears throat> as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. There was a big movement a few years ago, almost 30 years ago now. There were a group of people that were involved with and influenced in and by the Sovereign Grace Movement that had a date set and believed with all their heart, they had it proved biblically that the Lord was going to come back on that date. That's been 30 years ago. I knew it wasn't going to be because <clears throat> they thought he was. And what does this verse say? Therefore be ye also ready <clears throat> for in such an hour as what? As you think not. If everybody's thinking he is coming, I can tell you one thing for sure. He ain't coming. Who then is a faithful, <clears throat> that's the key, and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them their food, their meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now, it doesn't mean that that is a very rewarding job. It doesn't mean that those people are not aggravating, some of them, that he has to take care of. It doesn't mean that conditions are right and good and he's always being bragged on and patted on the shoulder and saying, you're really a good guy. He's not looking to those that he's feeding. He's looking to the one that's feeding him. Dear soul, you get your eyes on the world. You're going down. Peter did. You begin to look at the boisterous waves around about you. And listen, friend, they are waves. And they hold up whales and big old tiger sharks and all that stuff. You know, they'll swallow you up and you ain't nothing. You're not, you're not a pinhead compared to some of that stuff that's in the ocean. It'll swallow you up. Believe me, you are not walking on uh, solid ground if you're coming to the Lord. You're walking by faith. Yes, it's water. No, it's not supposed to hold you. What are you doing out there to start with? 
You need to go on and have faith in the Lord. Don't turn and look now towards, well, they don't appreciate me. Or, you know, they're not worthy of me doing this for them. Or why should I do this for them? Nobody ever did this for me. Really? Have you looked at the cross lately? God did a whole lot more than that for us. Isn't that something? God freely gave us his son. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? That's not quoted right. It's Romans 8.32. You can straighten it out if you want to read it. He says, who then is a faithful? That's the key. And wise servant. It's wise to be faithful. It's wise to continue on. And what is he? A wise servant. He that's going to be the greatest among you, let him be the servant of all. And who is that? The greatest among us is Jesus Christ. And who was he? He was the servant of all. So we are, we are servants of the servant king. This is how God wanted to spend eternity. Not with pride and ambition and, and, and striving for power and the preeminence, but for dying and, and dialing back. And, 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 and he said, go sell everything that you have and you'll have treasure in heaven. He said, I ain't going to do it. He said, your choice. It's wise to be faithful because our God is the true and faithful witness. He is the servant king. I do always those things that my father telleth me, those things my father instructs me to do. I do that. And so we are searching for ways to be faithful to God in every aspect of our identity, whatever you are, whatever relationship you're in. Seek to be a servant within that. And do what God told you to do. Well, they don't deserve it. Well, you don't either. Tell me of one soul in heaven right now that deserves to be there other than Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'll tell you what you can brag about. Brag about what you have not received. Well, that breath I just had to say that sentence. I got that from the Lord. I don't have anything I didn't receive. So that means I can't brag about anything, right? Right. So faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household. What is the ruling? It is to give them their food in due season. The shepherd rules over the sheep by the feeding of the gospel. It is the gospel that rules them, not the shepherd. But he is the, uh, the person in authority to, uh, to give out the gospel. Therefore, obey them that have the rule over you because they watch for your souls. Amen. And being watched over is a good thing because that inspires you and instills within you a desire yourself to watch therefore. They say... Um, a wise man learns by others' experiences. An average man learns by his own experience, and a fool never learns. But it is an amazing thing of how few people that I've met in my life will learn by example. You set the example before them, you do what you're supposed to do, don't make a bit of difference. They're going to go and do what they want to. But the Lord's people will come to understand by watching those that are set over them to be servants to their souls. And they come to understand some things about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily, truly, surely, I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, that is to put away the consciousness of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be absorbed in that which Noah's generation was absorbed with, and not attend to the things God told him to do here's what shall happen verse 49 he shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken 
the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. Guarantee you, all religious personnel who are seeking to feather their own nest and put a feather, as it were, in their own cap and to use it for their own fleshly desires and good, they will be caught unawares. The only way that you can continue to be the spiritual entity in Christianity that you're supposed to be is keep your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. That's the only way the things of this world will grow strangely dim is in the light of his glory and in the light of his grace. Amen. You can't keep on doing what you're doing when people just keep gobbling it up and don't appreciate it. Unless... You see yourself as one of those people before the Lord. And until he saved you and gave you a new nature, you were just like them. Mm. Sometimes you wonder if the kids are ever going to appreciate what you do. Let me just be honest with you. Can we talk? No, they never will. Not until they get a kid. What you need to do is start praying. Lord, give them as, as mean a kid as they are to me. <clears throat> They're not going to learn by, by, by illustration and example, parent. They're going to learn by experience. Wait till they get a kid who ignores them and doesn't appreciate them. Then they'll come back on a Saturday morning and sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and say, you know what? I doubt they'll say these words. I was an idiot when I was here in this house, and I didn't appreciate you like I should have. If he begins to smite his fellow servant to eat and drink with the drunken, he said, I guarantee you the Lord will come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and the Lord shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and there shall be gnashing of teeth with so much pain that's going on. Our Father, help us now that we might be able to see your word for your glory's sake in Christ's name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What shall be the sign of thy coming? <clears throat> there ain't but one thing he gave you. I don't care. You can tear your Bible up. I've tore up a whole lot of Bibles looking for it. Looking for something else. You won't find anything but Matthew 24, 14. The end shall come, emphatically states it, when the gospel is preached to all the world. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach. <clears throat> that's, that's the primary thing. And how am I to preach? Not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I'm not here to titillate your senses and make you have warm, fuzzy feelings. It shall be with the revelation of Christ's cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us that are saved, it is the power of God. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the end of the world is known by preaching. If there's anything that the religious man today hates... It's preaching. Notice I said religious man. So I am going to preach. I am not going to involve myself in the organization of religious tradition and uh, denominationalism. I don't want the cross to be made of none effect because you must enter into the kingdom through much tribulation. But the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Why didn't the foolish man know? Why didn't the evil servant know? 
He quit listening to the revelation of God. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. That's the world's wisdom. And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Those wise and prudent ones even within religion. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Listen. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, that is, by its own wisdom, by its own philosophy, knew not God. That's what happens in the world's wisdom. You ain't coming yet, or it's not going to come till they begin to ship the timbers and the stones back to Jerusalem that they're going to build the temple with. And they say the goat is already over there that they're going to sprinkle the blood on and turn him loose. And have you ever heard all that junk I have? But it just says it's the gospel, not Israel. It's preached to you. The word of God's come nigh you. It's the preaching. I hate preaching. Yeah, I know. Maybe if you get saved, God will make you see that it's your very lifeline to glory. If it's from the Lord. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom or by its philosophy knew not God. After that, it pleased God by the foolishness of blank to save them that believe. Preaching. Why? Why? Why are there empty benches here? You mean to tell me that that's the... That's the key to understanding and being ready for the immediate, right in your face, coming of the Lord. When he, he says, I come quickly, it doesn't mean that I'm going to come real soon. It means when I start coming, I'm going to get there real fast. Right. And it's going to be over with before some of them even realize this happened. And knew not till the flood came. Right. Now they know. Blah, 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 blah. They know now. Too late. By the foolishness of preaching to save the ones believing. Listen, who is it that asked Christ, show us a sign? Read the first phrase of verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Who did I read you in Mark chapter 13 and verse number 3? Peter and James and Andrew and so forth? It was Jews. And what do they require? Sign. But what about the Greeks? Oh, they're sitting up on the hill, you know, with a sheet wrapped around them and legs crossed, talking about how many hairs in that horse's tail over there in the book of the Revelation. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, that's the foolishness of the world. That's the world's wisdom. But we preach, but we preach, but we the thing that we're going to do is not going to be at, follow after the Jews or the Greeks. I'm not going to be a sign-seeking millennialist, neither am I going to be a high-minded, high-church Greek kind of person seeking after things that uh, make me look like I'm highly educated and you are dumb as a stump. What is it that is God is going to do to make sure that the world knows, uh, uh, the world of his elect knows that Christ is coming? But we preach, but we preach. What do you preach? Christ. How? Crucified. Now, what does that do to those in verse 22? Well, those requiring a sign, it's a stumbling block. I can't get this out. Because the bookstores are selling more of those second coming books yeah. written by Dr. Bottle Stopper that don't know his elbow from his big toe about any of this. And it's, the world is gobbling it up. Right. It's exciting. Come and hear Jack Van Eppy preach on the second coming of the Lord. Whoa, everybody has to go down there. You got to get the Civic Center for them to get in. We could just meet in the bathroom almost, it's, you know, as small as that is, uh, just a small room compared to those uh, who want to go hear all that stuff. Right. 
But unto them, listen, to the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, what? Didn't God say in verse 21 that it was by the foolishness of preaching? It ain't by the preaching of foolishness. You got more of that than you have the other way around. But it's the foolishness of preaching. Why? Because it stumbles the Jews and it aggravates the Greeks. But what does it do to the elect? But unto them which are called, whether they be Jews or whether they be Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. It presents the gospel preached to whether he's a Jew or a, or a Greek. Paul said, I had to go out in, in Galatians 1, 17, 18. I had to go out in the deserts of Arabia and didn't get back to Jerusalem for three years. Having to unlearn all that Jewish stuff. I didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. But I had to get rid of all the aspect of the Jewish flavor of it and come to see it was truth, but it was truth by the Holy Spirit in Christ. Not in David and Abraham, Moses, Christ. This book is about Christ. Search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me, John 5, 39. And he opened up the scriptures to him and showed him in the Psalms uh, and, and, and in the prophets and in all the word of God, the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 44, 45, somewhere in there. That's what we need to do. We need to have Christ preach to, him, to us. Listen, but the foolishness of God is wiser than men. You say, that's foolishness. Well, it's wiser than what men's wisdom is. Listen, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see your calling, brethren. God hadn't called the great and aloof people. He's called the things that were not, base things. And every one of them come. Let me make two statements. They sound like they contradict each other, but they don't. The gospel is supposed to be preached without exception to every man, to every creature in the world. But the gospel is only for the elect. Don't throw rocks at me. I covered both ends this thing. The hyper-Calvinist said, don't preach it to nobody but God's elect. No, it's, the gospel is for everybody in the whole world. Well, uh, well, if I preach it to everybody in the whole world, then it's an offer and therefore, it's up to the individual to accept it or not. Uh, who art thou, old man, that replies against God? No, you preach it to everyone, and those to whom God has granted faith and repentance to will believe it. Amen. Ain't that something? So, we have had... Multitudes of people come through this assembly since 1975 when we started. Where are, where are they? I don't know where all of them are or why they left, but I'll tell you this. This has to do with a lot of it. People don't have the ear, the heart to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ preached. Therefore, they go out and get involved in anything else other than that, and they wind up eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And next thing you know, bam, God's here and they've missed him. Be careful. I'm not saying you have to be a member of this church. In fact, I've always told you you didn't have to be. But I said you always have to be to follow the Lord and be where the preaching of the gospel is. Mm. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now listen, 
But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, in verses 12 and 13 again, he's saying we preach uh, freely that which God has given to us. Free, preach it to everybody. He don't have to be this, that, and the other. She don't have to be this, that, and the other. If you're a human being and you got a ear, I'll preach to you. But the word in verse 14 that starts off the verse says, contrary to what you might think, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That includes the elect. Their natural man didn't receive it. They had to be born again. There was a spiritual man created within them by the sovereign grace of Almighty God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. My soul. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Lord said, watch. <clears throat> and he said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to get darker. It's going to get, it's going to get blacker. It, it, it's going to get more sinful. Iniquity shall abound. How are, you going to, how are you going to maintain a Christian compassion of love in doing what God said about being a watchful servant? You can't do it without the brother, like, like the brother talked about this morning, the washing of water by the word of God. Do you remember what Jesus said, uh, uh, what he told us that we were not to grow weary in, neither grow weary in well doing? Really? How about that? So it's possible, just, just say, I've had enough. Well, then you're looking in the wrong direction. And I hope and pray God will close up that window for you and that door for you like he did Noah and have nothing but a door in the top to look up. Because you're not going to make it without looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And consider him. Uh, because look at the contradiction of sinners against himself. And, and he was the perfect man, deserved nothing but adoration and praise and got everything but that. And dear soul, you're not going to make it if you don't stay under the anointed preaching of the Holy Ghost. Whoever that is, wherever that is, find it and get under it. Or else you will be caught unawares because there is a deception already in this world that to me the only way you can define it is by those two words, strong delusion not that the devil shall sin, but God shall send them strong delusion. These people are so deluded they don't know that they're deceived. These people are involved in every kind of religious stupidity you can imagine and think it's of the Lord. And it's going to catch them unawares. Because they are making God in their image and not seeking to be made in God's image. It's dangerous, folks. It's dangerous. You need to find the preaching of the Spirit of God and, and, and stay under it and let God wash you with water by His Word. In Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> in verse number 30, we told you <clears throat> that the sign of Christ's coming was His coming. The only thing you can find in that verse, then shall the sign of the Son of Man, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Okay, this is going to answer the question in verse 3, right? Right. It's the only other place the word signs mentioned in this chapter. Now, then what, is, what are they going to see? I told you there are three words in verse 30 of Matthew 24 you need to pay attention to. Sign, see, and coming. 
What shall they see? They shall see the Son of Man coming. His getting here is all the sign the world's going to get. But, dear soul, we begin to understand and perceive and we assemble ourselves together as we see the day approaching. Now, let me back this up. What is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? It is His coming. All right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. This is so simple, you're going to think, well, that can't be right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. <clears throat> and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Now read me the rest of the verse. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. There it is. What is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man? It's the Son of Man coming. How shall he come? With such a brightness that it destroys everything wicked. Look at back at chapter 1, verse 8. In uh, verse 7, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, how shall he be revealed? With his mighty angels, how? In flaming fire. Isn't that bright? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So the glory of His power is going to suddenly appear and destroy everything wicked and it is going to be like flaming fire to consume everything that is evil and the elements shall be melted with fervent heat and we are, are looking for a new heavens and a new earth. The sign of the Lord's coming is nothing more than the Lord's coming. Wait a minute. I thought maybe we would, you know, have first gear and uh, they say, well, this particular thing got to happen. Okay, then that happens. Well, and then, then you put it in second gear and, and now the, uh, a few more signs, a little bit more powerful. We can see that and we'll, we'll begin to prepare. Then we we'll put it in third gear and, and, and more we really know have to, we're going to have to be real careful because it's this thing's escalated. Sign, little sign, bigger signs and biggest signs and then we'll know the Lord's coming. No. What is the victory that overcometh the world, even your faith? A wise and faith full servant. A wise and servant who is full of faith will see and know and be ready when the Lord comes. Why? Because he knows, well, he's fixing to come in just a few minutes. No. He's, he don't know when. He just knows he's ready if he does. That's it. Well, we're going to have, you know, seven years of whatever. I don't want to go into all that mess. And then the Lord will come back. That ain't what God said. That's what I was taught. Man, I didn't go out in the Arabian Desert three years to unlearn. It took me 60 years to unlearn all that mess. But those books sure do make good kindling. <clears throat> Anyhow, the sign of the Lord's coming given by God himself, the son who, who is coming, said... It will be my coming. So there's no sign to build up and to get ready to get ready to get ready. Well, it's, you know, it's April the 1st. We better get ready, you know. We got to foul our Texas by the 15th. Well, here it is, April the 10th. Good gracious, we better. If you got that other stuff we need, we got to get that ready. No. Bam, he's here. So what do we do? He told you what to do. Watch, 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 watch. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Hebrews 12, 29, don't turn to it. Our God is a consuming fire. 
Second Peter chapter three: uh, uh, The earth shall melt with fervent heat, seeing that the, the, all these things shall be what manner of persons ought ye ought to be in all holiness. Then the knowledge of God coming and burning up the world has a direct effect on true sanctification. What a balanced lesson we heard this morning about justification and sanctification. And one of the things, come on, we might as well read it. Second Peter. <clears throat> chapter 3 there's so people are not uh, not uh, preparing themselves and in, in growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and they're not developing themselves in true holiness if they don't have an understanding that they are responsible to the Lord and could, could be called into his presence by physical death today or he could come before the day is out and they'd have to give an account you know, I'm amazed, people. Because there is no fear of God before their eyes, they think they can get away with anything. All you got to do is fool the police. I'm going to shoot my wife and tell them it was an accident. Come on, you dummy. Uh, you, you shouldn't shoot anybody because you're going to have to give an account to God. What did Joseph do? There, he didn't have any mind about the police or whatever. He had an awareness of God. He said, I'm not going to do this wicked thing you want me to do, Ms. Potiphar, because i got to give an account to God. God consciousness is the greatest deterrent to sin you've ever had, and God consciousness is the only preparation for being ready for the coming of the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, opposed to those which were overflowed with water in Noah's day, in verse 6, by the same word are kept in store. God's word is the only thing keeping this world together. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of, God, of ungodly men. And uh, he said, be careful about thinking God is slack or, or you just, you're mistaking God's long suffering for his slackness. Verse number 10, but the day of the Lord will come. How? As a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. What goes with the awareness of the coming of the Lord in the brightness of his glory to destroy all the wicked and to, and to purify the earth with fire? What's the next verse? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, manner of life, and godliness? Sanctification is directly connected to the awareness that Jesus Christ is going to come and me and you are going to have to individually give an account for that which he gave in our, it, it, to, to us to use. I don't care whether you're one, two, or five talents. Don't make any difference. Every one of us is going to have to give an account and turn back into God uh, in a better condition what we give back to him than what it was when he gave it to us. You give your money to the bank. You say, I'm putting $100. Ten years ago, they said, you ready to draw it out? Say, yeah, well, here's your $100 back. Uh-uh. -uh. <laughs> With interest. Right? right. Yeah. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got the Bible. You've got the prophets. You've got the Psalms. You've got preachers. You've got teachers. You, you, listen, the prayers of God's people. You've got the local church. You have been blessed and enhanced with every kind of blessing God can possibly give. Tell God, don't tell me, tell God what he's left out so that you can't really be the Christian he wants you to be. Go ahead. I'll wait on you. We'll watch you get thrown out the window. There's nothing that hadn't been done that could be done. For our enhancing that which God birthed in us, we are to grow it and to nurture it and to bring it into a better state and return it back to God with interest in a better condition than he gave us. Well, you say, well, man, that's a lot of responsibility. Sure it is. 
Well, preacher, what you going to give me to help you? I just gave it to you. Believing in the second coming of the Lord, a God consciousness, a knowing that the world that you know right now, just like Noah's day, is going to be gone. Excuse my old bad English, but it ain't coming back. Sanctification is directly connected to the second coming. Listen at verse 12. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. You know what? I fail in both of them. Sometimes I don't look for it. I get so self-conscious that I lose my God consciousness. And I don't know that I've ever hastened unto it. There's times when I wish I was out of this world. I don't know if that counts or not. Hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord were in the heavens being on fire. Can you imagine that? The atmosphere burning, the elements melting. Shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, that's his word, right? How are you going to know about that promise? The preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to remain on this earth until the Lord comes back. They say, well, there's 50% of all the animal species have died since whatever year. We've got 50%, uh, only 50% of all the animal species left on this earth than when we started. Oh, we're going to give out oil. Oh, we're going to give out corn. Oh, we're going to give out water. Oh, we're going to give out. I'll tell you one thing you ain't going to give out of. You ain't going to give out of preaching. That's right. Amen. Amen. Matthew 24, 14 again. The end the not going to come till all the world's heard the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's going to take care of you. But you got a responsibility in that. It brings you to the awareness of God's glory. It makes you understand, dear soul, this thing's going to be violent. It's going to be horrible. Great men, mighty men, strong men are going to cry for rocks to fall on them and crush them. They're going to be running in, in caves like mice running into holes. Seeking to get away from what? The wrath of the Lamb. Wow. The lamb, yes. What can I do to prepare for it? If I was you, can we talk? I'd stay under the anointing preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ if I could find any. And I would obey what that anointing said, whether I liked that coot that was saying it or not. I'd do what God told me. And I'd make sure that I never had a day that I didn't have a conversation and a communion with God Almighty. And I wouldn't go to him with my grocery list, tear that thing up, do away with it. You've been trained more to duty than you have devotion. Somebody ought to say amen on that one then. Amen. And dear soul, Have a personal, intimate communion with Jesus Christ in your heart and life. Then you'll be prepared. You'll be watching. And you'll do what he says. Mm. So it, he instructs us. If you'll look back to Matthew 24, let's kind of top this thing off. That is, if it's toppable. Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> what are the first two words in verse 42? Watch Watch there, Lord. What is the first phrase in verse 44? And would you read me the entirety of verse 50?
All right. Now, of those three verses, what did you come up with? What is the instruction concerning the second coming of the Lord? It is under the heading that you can't know. Watch therefore, why? For you know not. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready. Why? For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Then the entirety of verse 50 says that. So what is the, in, the biblical instruction from God concerning the second coming of the Lord? It's going to happen and nobody knows when it's going to happen. And God even re removed it from the Son of Man as the teacher of the church because it was not a subject for him to teach. I do not want anybody knowing this, not even the angels. Why? So that they would watch and be ready. It is to spur us on to a conscious Excuse me, a continuous watchfulness. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. The book of Hebrews chapter 9. So Christ was once offered... To bear the sins of many. Did you get in on that? You say, yeah, the Lord saved me and made application of Christ's righteousness to my soul and he washed me in the blood of the Lamb. All right, second phrase. And unto them that look for him. Wait a minute. What did you have to do to have Christ bear your sins? Nothing. But receive the effect of it. What did you do to God to get him to force Christ to bear your sin? Nothing. What did you do for your mama to produce that little red wrinkled face lizard <laughs> that they presented and say, you got a boy or you got a girl? Nothing. But the second part of this verse says, but unto them that look for him shall he appear, next three words, the second time. How did he appear to you first? By absolute sovereign grace. You didn't even know that you needed a new heart till God already had given you one. But the second time, you're going to be required to look for Him. Isn't that right? Mm. Now, what then is the great sin against this doctrine? All right, what's the great blessing of this doctrine? God has, by his own wisdom, brought forth the knowledge of Jesus Christ to us, which is a stumbling block to the Jews who seek for a sign, and is foolishness to the Greeks who seek after wisdom. But God has brought forth what those Greeks and Jews would call the foolishness of preaching in order to save those that are believing when they hear it. So the great blessing of God to prepare you that you be not caught unawares as they did in the days of Noah at the coming of the Lord is to avail yourself of that preaching. All right, if that's the great blessing, again, the question is before us, what is the great sin against our preparedness for the second coming of the Lord? It's in chapter 10 of Hebrews. You don't even have to turn the page. 
Verse 23, let us, verse 22, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of faith. Verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and good works. If you see somebody not watching, punch them with the elbow and say, hey, wake up over there. Listen, not forsaking, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some already is, but encouraging, exhorting one another, and so much the more, finish verse 25 for me, and so much the more, You say, I don't know what is coming. If anybody says they do, they're either deceived or they're a liar. Or maybe both. I don't know the day nor the hour. But there is something about the discerning Christian with the Holy Ghost inside him that will exhort one another Encourage one another. What is that uh, that song, Brother Jamie? We are God's people. What what uh, page is that on? Can you find that for me, right quick? You 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 make sure that your ember causes that darkening ember of your brother or sister to enliven again by you exhorting them. And so much the more as you begin to discern and see the, the day of the approaching Son of God. Have you got it, brother? Yes. What page is it? It's 283. Oh, it's, it's how much? 283. Oh, $2.83. <laughs> Y'all turn it to Brother James is going to read you that verse. What verse is it, Brother Jamie? It's the last one, number four. Okay. 283, the last verse. This keeps coming to me, and I couldn't remember where the song was. And bless his heart, Jamie was good enough to look it up for us and tell us. So I'd, li I'd like to him, if he will, to read it for us. And you just listen to this concerning Hebrews chapter 10, okay? We are a temple, the Spirit's dwelling place, formed in great weakness, a cup to hold God's grace. We die alone, for on its own each ember loses fire. Yet joined in one, the flame burns on to give warmth and light and to inspire. Isn't that good? Now, that brother or sister, I don't know who wrote it. Brother. Brother. Knew something about God. You have an unction with the Holy One and you know all things. And dear soul, has it not been your, has it not been your experience that from time to time, you were dying alone, but you came to the assembly and the preaching of the word enhanced, like fuel on the fire, enhanced the warmth and the gathering together of those coals, those embers that come together, cause you to flame up again. So what is the great sin against the preparation for the coming of the Son of the Lord? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more, more exaltation, in, it, it increases as you see the day approaching. All right. The next verse is going to talk about willful sin. It is not a blank check to talk about all willful sin unless you can have the Holy Spirit help you with that. But this is talking about the specific sin of forsaking to assemble ourselves together. It's a willful sin. For if we sin like that willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, you know that God has spoken to you. Don't leave it. Therefore, he said, if you walk away from that, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And how did he say he's going to destroy that wicked over there in, in Thessalonians? He shall destroy him with the blank of his coming. Brightness of his coming. That's what's going to get you if you walk away from it. But a fearful looking for of judgment and 
fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You thought it was bad under Moses. They died physically without mercy under two or three witnesses. Listen at the first part of verse 29. Of how much sorrow or worse punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherein he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Brother Jamie talked about that this morning too. Grieving and quenching the Spirit. Dear soul, the greatest blessing that God can give you is the anointing preaching of the Word. The Greeks won't like it. It's not wise enough. The, the Jews won't like it. They want signs. And all these Jew Baptists out here trying to say, well, we're going to build the temple again. When we do that, well, no. I fool on you. The sign of the Lord's coming is the Lord's coming. Right. And it's going to be over then. So in other words, you don't get a sign except, bam, he's here. So what do we have to help us with that? The anointing preaching of God, the fellowship of the believers. As we see the day approaching, we begin to exhort, encourage, uplift, to, to edify one another more powerfully than we ever have before. And then what is the greatest sin against this? Walking away from that. So that your ember then dies out. But that fire that you didn't want, you'll see it in the eyes of Jesus Christ when he shall come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on his adversaries. Kind of simple, isn't it? Not anything you're going to be able to call your cousin who's got all them books on the second coming. And him get excited about. But it's the book. And now what do you do with this? Hide these words in your heart. That you might not sin against him. There is no sign. It's just Jesus coming. How can we be ready? God has provided you with preaching. Shall preaching ever end on the earth? No, that's when the earth's going to end. When preaching ends, the earth is over and done with. Then shall the end come. What's the greatest sin against this provision? Walking away from anointed preaching. God have mercy.